Segment 6, the Ptolemaic model of planetary motion. For thousands of years, the Greek science had a tremendous influence on our worldview, on our thinking about the world. Greek astronomers came up with amazing amounts of interesting insight into the phenomena of nature, including understanding that the Earth was round, having a pretty good idea of the size of the Earth, and the relative sizes of the Earth and the Moon and the Sun, and a number of other things. In this era, however, their philosophy influenced their thinking and led them to a particular worldview that continued into the, into the uh, late Renaissance. In this picture, we had a celestial sphere that surrounded the Earth, and this, this was divided up into a series of concentric circles that, that contained first the atmosphere, then the moon, then the, the inner planets, the sun, then the outer planets, and finally a fixed sphere that, that on which all of the stars rotated. This concept's actually not a very bad concept as a, as a mechanical model of, of what we see on the sky, as we'll see as we, as we look at it. But there are some problems that are what eventually led to its demise as a working theory of the universe. In all this, we need to keep straight the difference between real motion, apparent motion relative to the horizon, and apparent motion relative to the stars. The motion of planets on the sky, in general, is just like the stars. The planets rise in the east, and they set in the west each night. However, they don't stay in the same place among the stars. The, the word for planet comes from a word for, for wanderer, and it's because they wander among the stars during the course of, of time. The planets, and uh, as we've actually seen, the, the sun, all move through the sky along a thin band called the ecliptic. This is plane is actually the orbit of the Earth around the sun, and projected onto the sky. And in fact, all of the other planets have their orbits almost in the same plane. So here's a, a true today outside view of the solar system, and the the eight planets with the exception of, of Mercury, have very, very similar orbits. Mercury, the innermost planet's orbit's a bit more tipped. And then that fellow, the demoted fellow Pluto, is out there, is, is e e even much more tipped with respect to uh, the ecliptic plane. But, but they're all within a few degrees of each other. So everything is, is fine. This picture that was promulgated by the Greeks is fine until you start to watch the positions and note the positions too closely. And what I said before, that they don't keep the same position, is actually a little bit more drastic than that. Normally, they, they move to the east relative to the star. So everything's moving from east to west across the sky. But as you watch relative to a nearby star, the planets on, a, on any given night will typically move a bit to the east over the course of time relative to the stars. But once in a while, for a period of a few weeks, they'll stop, turn around and move west with respect to the stars, and then stop, and then go back to moving east again. This westward motion is called retrograde motion, that is, motion against the normal direction. So they're moving west with respect to the stars during retrograde motion because they normally move east with respect to the stars. How is this phenomenon explainable? Let me just first I illustrate this in a couple of ways before we get to that question of how it's explainable. Here's a, a, a couple of, of pictures of looking at the sky, showing the ecliptic plane projected on the sky, and how Mercury's orbit plays out and how Venus's orbit play out in that picture, moving first one way and then the other. With the outer planets, it's much more remarkable. Here you see some constellation, and you see images of Mars at four-day intervals starting on the right. Mars is marching off to the east with respect to that constellation. All of a sudden it stops. That's where the dots get closer together. Then it marches to the west for a while, stops again, and then resumes its eastward march across the sky. How do we explain this? Well, the Greeks, going from starting with Aristotle, shown here on a, on a Greek stamp from the first time that, that Greece was not part of the Euro, and uh, 
picture, a uh, bust of Ptolemy, who was about four centuries later, who wrote a great star catalog called the Almagest. The Greek argument for a stationary Earth was not just made up. It, it was based on, on a, a philosophical idea of perfect spheres. You had the spherical Earth, and then you had this series of perfect spheres around it, which contained the other heavenly bodies but also on an, on an observational fact, which was the stars are, they, the stars m don't appear to move when you, ch when you change your position, when you change time of year. Because they don't appear to move, the argument was the Earth couldn't be moving. It had to be fixed still. It, the, the, there was no difference in positions of the stars over time relative to one another. We know today that, that in fact, there is such a difference. It's just sm so small that you can't measure it with the unaided eye. Now, this perfect sphere idea worked except for the retrograde motion. And Ptolemy then had to come up with a scheme to explain the retrograde motion. And he came up with this idea of epicycles, which are smaller circles, which the planets move along while they're moving along their sphere. And they move along these epicycles more quickly, so this allows them to occasionally move backwards. He had to add a few more things to make it work. He had to move the Earth from the center of the set of spheres. Each displacement had to be a little bit different. It was called an eccentric, depending upon which planet it was. And so each planet's sphere was a little bit cockeyed with respect to the last one. How does this allow for retrograde motion? Well, when you spin this, e this epicycle, if the epicycle is spinning more quickly than the motion of the epicycle along the circle around the, the Earth, then it will occasionally allow the planet to move backwards before rolling up onto it again. It's as if you roll a small hoop around on top of a big hoop, you get this effect. This was a very complicated way to get retrograde motion. It wasn't particularly satisfactory.